The U.S. is no longer profitable. By Dmitry Orlov. Published, May 3, 2023. I am allergic to gambling of any sort and I don't even like games of chance, not because I am bad at it, mind you, but it's just not my thing. I am what brokers of all sorts hate the most, a buy and hold investor. I have a crystal ball of sorts and I gaze into it periodically, set course accordingly, and maintain it for decades. I gazed into it right before the year 2000 and based on what I saw I liquidated all mutual funds and bought a bunch of gold. That netted me just around 600% return so far or 28% per year, but that's against the US dollar, which isn't saying much. Gold is not an investment, it is just a metal that holds its value over time. The US dollar, on the other hand, does not hold its value over time, and neither does the US as a whole if we ignore some financial bubbles. In any case, in 2016 I formed a sufficiently cohesive picture of the future in my mind, and here it is. The graph shows the Fed Fund's rate traveling to zero, which it reached in 2008, and then to the nether regions that lie below zero at a perfectly linear pace of about a third of a percent per year. According to my admittedly simple-minded projection, the prime rate this year should be around negative 4%, that is, the Federal Reserve should be paying banks 4% a year to borrow from it. But that did not happen. Instead, the Fed was forced to reverse course. It did so for three reasons. 1. Inflation reared its ugly head and the Fed is supposed to keep it under control with the only tool it has. 2. Federal debt is the Fed's main product, and if it doesn't manage to sell at least $1.3 trillion of it this year the US government is toast, so it has to make it look attractive. 3. The idea of a negative interest rate policy, or NERP, where your creditors pay you to hold their money, potatoes grows on trees and foxes regurgitate live chickens, is too topsy-turvy for most people's brains. In any case, none of this is working and I believe I can explain why using pictures. 1. In order to crush inflation, the Fed Fund's rate has to be above the rate of inflation. If it is below it, then it is still possible to make money from inflation, keeping it in place and perhaps even driving it higher. Suppose you borrow at 5% and inflation is at 10%. Then you can borrow some money, buy and stockpile some commodities, coal, for instance, which can be stored in a pile under the open sky, wait a year, sell them for 10%, pay off the loan with 5% interest, and pocket 5% profit. Right now Fed funds rate is 4.83%, inflation is at 4.98% and a recent chart from Statista looks like this. But the official inflation rate is fake, based on bogus hedonic adjustments and other statistical sleights of hand introduced in 1990. The real inflation number based on the original methodology, from John Williams Shadowstats.com, is over 8%. Fighting 8% inflation with a 5% interest rate is like trying to shoot a pool with a rope. 2. Selling US government debt was easy back when everyone in the world needed to hold US dollars in order to trade with each other. But now that everyone is in a rush to get away from the dollar and to switch to trading in their own currencies, US debt is no longer so attractive. For most of the world, their main trading partner is now China. And half of China's trade is now in yuan, not dollars. What's more, it has by now dawned on most people around the world that the US is a giant pus-filled bubble that's ready to burst and they don't want to get spattered when it does. The dollarization is now going full steam ahead and has shifted from first slowly mode to all at once mode. 3. It seems like the NERP experiment is over by now. Even the Germans, who were for a time major suckers for this thing, have raised their rates, with the German central bank having bottomed out at negative 0.88%. And so, the question remains, why did the overall return on investment of the US economy, as echoed by the Fed Fund's rate, steadily increase by around 0.3% a year for four decades now? I believe that the answer is that for these past four decades, the US has been in squander mode, 
Going from a production-based economy to a services-based economy where most of the services have to do with finance, insurance, real estate, medicine, law, education and other such activities of dubious value. Industry has been shipped off to other countries and the competencies it requires have been lost. The final nail in the U.S. services-based economy was driven in by Russia's Prime Minister Mikhail Mishustin when he introduced an innovation euphemistically called parallel import. Since the U.S. is a rogue state, invading countries under false pretenses and without UN authorization, looting the treasuries of countries around the world by freezing their assets, and imposing unilateral, and therefore illegal, economic sanctions, why should anyone have to play by U.S. rules? It is therefore perfectly all right to circumvent U.S. sanctions using various third parties. Furthermore, it is no longer necessary to pay the U.S. for patents, intellectual property rights, broadcast rights, software licenses, use of brand names, and various other services related ephemera. All of this stuff is now free. But it is generally understood that the U.S. won't be able to provide all of these services forever, now that it isn't being paid for them, and so it is important to replace them with services from more trusted suppliers. Here is a specific example, both China, Huawei, and Russia, Technojet, are working to replace the 50-year-old TCP IP protocol that is used to route almost all internet traffic, there is also UDP, but the U stands for unreliable, and it isn't used for much. TCP in particular is in need of an update because it has severe latency issues when it has to compensate for lossy transmission channels. Now, if a country has a trade deficit that's nearing $1 trillion per year and can't get paid for the large share of its exports that is services-based and therefore ephemeral, what does that look like? Like this, perhaps? If the US is still going bankrupt slowly rather than all at once, its overall return on investment, based on my chart, stands at around negative 3% per year. Because of that, what the Fed funds rate actually adjusts is who goes bankrupt first, if it is set higher, US companies will go bankrupt first, set it lower, and the government will be unable to finance its ever-growing budget deficit, and will be forced to default. And no matter where it is set, there will still be plenty of inflation because the US dollar is no longer in demand around the world. I said this back in 2016 and I'll say it again, this is not a problem for, the bankers, to solve, this is a predicament. They will delay and pray, and make pronouncements loaded with keywords designed to please the high frequency trading algorithms that are in charge of artificially levitating the free market with judiciously timed injections of free money. But in the end, all they can do is act brave, wait for a distraction, and then run for the exits. And your job is to make it to the exits before they do. This podcast was brought to you by BG Media. Download the BG Media app today or visit barglobal.net for more podcasts.